We are extremely honored uh, to have here at our lecture series of the Russian Revolution, Professor Stephen Naftiger of Williams College. Professor Naftiger has completed his PhD in economics at Yale University. He is one of the leading economic historians of the Russian Empire. His work has been published in the Journal of Economic History, in the European Review of Economic History, in Explorations of in Economic History, and other major outlets of our discipline. Uh, where we economists uh, essentially aspire and want to get our, our stuff published. Uh, Professor Naftiger is also a faculty uh, affiliate with the Dedi Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. Um, uh, we're extremely happy to have him here uh, with a very expedited flight from Connecticut <laughs> to Ireland, to Germany. Uh, and um, uh, his topic today is going to be, was everything revolutionized, uh, long-run economic legacies of Imperial Russia. Professor Nafziger, welcome to the Free University and the Austrian Europa Institute. We're very happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very, very much. <laughs> <coughs> so, first off, can everyone hear me all right? At the back, over there, yeah? Okay. I'm very uncomfortable carrying a microphone around. Uh, so I'm just going to speak. Um, and thank you so much for Theotaros for inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, it gave me the chance to really think about some things that I've been thinking about for a long time and think in more deep fashion. Um, like he mentioned, I'm an economist. Uh, my training is in economics. Uh, but my focus of all my research to date has been on Russian economic history, in particular imperial Russian economic history, the little stabs into the Soviet period. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about today is sort of framed around how economists think about historical issues. Um, and off the top, I want to contrast what I'm doing uh, here, trying to do here, or I guess contrast is sort of the wrong word. I want to point out that economists today, a group of economists, are engaged in research into what's known as sort of issues of long-run persistence. How did stuff that happened a long time ago matter? How does it affect the world we live in today? How does it affect the way economies function today? Um, that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. But that's not the type of economic history I actually do, or I'm a real big fan of. And so at the end, and maybe in the discussion, we can talk a little bit about the distinction I'm, I would like to draw between works like that, something happened in the past, and things are correlated or related to that today, and what historians actually do, investigating the past, in my brand of historian, investigating the past using the tools of economics. So that may not be very clear right now, but I think by the end of the talk, it'll be clear what I mean by that distinction. OK. My starting point is simply to point out that Russia, prior to 1917, was a very poor place. Uh, it was a large economy, just based in sheer size and number of people. But per capita terms, it was very poor. Much of the countries we know of today that were part of the Russian Empire, you know, Baltic sort of excluded, right, are fairly poor or lagging in some dimensions today. Right? And so you could ask, or I'm going to ask, what about the imperial world might help us explain or understand the sort of lagging performance of many, uh, many post-Soviet sort of countries today. Right? And so in some sense, this is going to be an unusual part of this lecture series, as far as I understand it. Um, my German's very bad, so I don't pretend to understand the titles of some of the other talks in the series. Um, and then I'm going to actually focus on sort of what 1917 didn't do in this talk. What remained the same, and remains the same in a very long run way, OK? Um, now, this focus on the imperial legacy for modern Russia, and I'm going to mostly be talking about Russia, though what I'm going to say surely applies to Belarus, it applies to Ukraine, it probably applies to the other republics, but my focus is primarily Russia, to modern Russia. So this has been discussed by other people, some very prominent people. Uh, Igor Gaidar in his book, Russia, the Long View, or something like that, it was very explicit about this, uh, the pointing, trying to point out at least, that there were connections between the past and the present. Right? Gerard Roland, Theotaris' advisor at Berkeley has also remarked upon this in some of his writings. Right? Um, the issue, as I see it, is that most people that have made this statement that, oh, stuff that happened in Imperial Russia, or the, the way things were formed, or the way the economy functioned in Imperial Russia directly impacts today, 
none of them have actually shown direct evidence of this, okay? Or tried to really point out how the actual economic channels functioned to make the past matter for the present. And that's what this particular paper, or this particular presentation, I should say, is gonna try to do. Okay, first off the bat, now here's the big caveat. Everything I'm saying here is gonna be very suggestive, and very speculative in some ways. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna, a large chunk of the talk will be about a particular work I've been involved in that does do this, tries to map some aspect of the Imperial Russian economy to outcomes today, right? But much of the rest is just sort of pulling together things and drumming up some ideas and putting forth some speculative thoughts about the possible connections between the past and the present. I'll come back to this point at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna propose four different mechanisms for thinking about how the imperial world relates to the sort of modern Russian, Ukrainian, so on economies. Right? First is gonna be about geography. That's gonna be sort of straightforward. And that's not even about the imperial Russia necessarily, but that's something about long-standing conditions in Russia that are gonna matter for today. That's maybe so simplistic doesn't even uh, bear repeating. The second is going to be human capital. And I'll be precise what I mean by human capital when I come to that. I realize most people in the audience are not economists, so I'll spell that out. The third are going to be institutional features of the imperial economy, right? And not just the economy per se, but the whole political structure and about how that impacted the, the economy and how those interactions matter for today. Similar interactions or long run effects of the interactions. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about culture. Um, so there's probably more people in the room that are interested in, say, anthropology or sociology. And economists have increasingly, I think Theo Charis' work does a little bit of this as well, economists have been increasingly interested in culture and defining it for sort of, from an economic standpoint. And so I'll spend a little time there at the end. Right. I'm gonna touch on works a little bit by myself, but many other people uh, who have thought about these types of issues. And like I mentioned, I'm gonna focus most of the talk on a bit of a case study example uh, that's gonna integrate at least geography, human capital, and institutional conditions to think about a long run effects of the imperial world on modern Russia. Okay. So my takeaway, if you fall asleep now, my takeaway is that economic history, as I'll talk about today, really does matter. And it matters for thinking about the way the Russian economy works today, right? Um, but not in a simple correlate, cor I don't think that's a word, correlation sense, meaning that, oh, there's conditions in the past that are really correlated with conditions today. No, you have to spell out the history that's actually mapping the past to the present. That's the key to doing this well, or to doing it in a convincing way. That's my final point here. Understanding the underlying economics and the history is what really matters for making this a valid exercise. All right. First off, geography. I'm, <laughs> let's just say, the probably 10,000th person that has made this point, that the Russian economy is structured in ways today and in the past, right, that are based firmly around its geographic conditions, whether that's climate, soil conditions, the size, and so on. Um, this goes back to Elise Kluchevsky, sort of preeminent imperial <laughs> Russian historian, but more recent, works such as the work by Fiona Hill and Clifford Gatty have argued that, um, that you know, Soviet policies reinforce many of these geographic constraints by misappropriating resources from the west to the east. Some people have argued, a long literature of people, have argued that Russia has these elements of a, of a frontier economy, both in the past and continuing on today. This is a point made by Hill and Gatty. There's a repeated emphasis, I don't need to belabor this point, that Russian, the Russian economic activity in the past and the present has been resource driven. Right? As much as you know, Putin and Medvedev try to make noise about moving the economy away from resource dependence, it's clear they haven't done very much. And that was true by the end of the imperial period as well. A second element of geography is a little more complicated, and this is where I'm gonna step, you know, touch on some economics real quickly, is that the pattern, the spatial pattern of activity, you know, where factories were located, where certain sectors were based, right? 
has longer run, has long run effects. This is something that economic geographers talk a lot about. And that these long run effects persisted even through the Soviet adjustments. That's a key part of my story today. So these could include things like the way the, again, way industry is distributed around regionally. This could include tr the building of transportation infrastructure networks, mattering going forward to the, the way the network persists in particular ways. Right? And it might matter for thinking about, you know, or in the past, you know, ethno sort of religious networks of people and their geographic location impacting the types of economic activities that occur. A good example here would be productivity in parts of the Ukraine and in Russia um, in areas where German settlers came in, right? And those productivity actually seems to be higher throughout the period, throughout the 20th century as well, even when the Germans disappeared, okay? So this sort of broaches or brings up a whole area of economics research that sort of goes by different names, economic geography being the broadest one, that focuses on what we call agglomeration effects. As you push different types of economic activity together, that's going to improve the productivity of those workers, firms, agents active in that economic activity. Push that productivity up, right? Um, and therefore lead economic activity to concentrate in certain ways over time, right? And while it's the case that the Soviets did a lot of things to disrupt these economic geography processes that were at work, right, they didn't do it all. They didn't do everything, and I'll come back to that point. So, in particular, I want to mention the work. So, Andrei Markovich at the New Economic School and Tatiana Mikhailova at the um, Russian Academy for the National Administration Economy or whatever it's called, they've really argued this hard point that, you know, the, the, the Soviet Union did do things to reallocate resources, right? And did it in ways that did disrupt some of these things up here. But they also point out that there's a lot of persistence, right? And the important thing is to understand how that persistence what it looked like, and how it really matters for today, for thinking about today's economy. Just to show that I can show pictures too, um, what do we mean by this, in, uh, or the, sort of the, the distribution of economic activity in Imperial Russia? Well, I just went over my computer, looked at my computer last night, I found this map of industrial output by district, by Uwezd, uh, in 1868, right? And we can see, I can have a little pointer here, right? We know Moscow was industrialized in the region around Moscow throughout the imperial period. And by this time, the sort of northwest was industrialized as well. But what the argument I'm making is that these other regions, even with Soviet policies in place that probably moved factories, that did, not probably, that did move factories around, particularly after the war, right? They didn't maybe disrupt this fundamental geography that exists here. Okay, human capital. What do I mean by human capital? This is the sort of capabilities, the skills, the education of the labor force in particular. Right? Russia, in the past, had extremely low levels of human capital. Right? Literacy rates didn't break 50% for the population until after the revolution. Right? The question is, can we connect that, those, that weakness to today in any way, shape, or form? Right? Now, the sort of immediate reaction is probably not, let me come back to that point in a second, given that Soviet policies, at least in the 20s and 30s, were geared around educating the population, particularly women, right? Um, so we think that maybe there was no direct reason why low levels of human capital in the 19th century would have persisted to today. And we all know that at least in aggregate, Russian human capital, measurable Russian human capital today is at a quite high level, right? in terms of, say, attendance in university and things of that sort, right? But were there, was there, well, excuse me, was there a reason why the past mapped to the present in terms of human capital? Well, when it comes to demography, which is more of a driver of human capital, you know, the how many, you know, fertility rates of the population, health conditions of the population, I'll include here, turns out the revolution almost surely did matter. We know that average household size in Russia plummeted between 1917 and the war, uh, World War II, right? Um, and health conditions dramatically improved, at least subject to a lot of shocks, but dramatically improved as more resources were poured into modern medicine, right? So the revolution there did matter. 
But other work, um, and here I'm mentioning uh, work by a woman who's at, I believe, LSE right now, um, in the political science department, I think. Um, Tatiana Latkina, she showed that there's a, at least a correlation between the geography of human capital, say literacy rates in the late 19th century, and school attainment today. Okay? So one explanation that she wants to point to is maybe some persistence of religious variation. So other work, I'm mentioning Sasha Becker and Ludger Voisman here, not that you have to remember that, right? but these are economic historians who have focused on the distribution of Protestants and Catholics in Prussia, right? showing that that distribution, which they can measure, say, in the early 19th century, actually mapped into long-run differences in industrialization, uh, human capital accumulation down the road, and income levels even today within Prussia, right? Well, what, is, what was Prussia, right? Their story here is that, it, you know, it, it's because Protestantism meant people read, were encouraged to read the Bible, and that encouraged to read the Bible, raised the benefits of educating your children. And so more, relatively more people educate their children. And then there's an intergenerational component. You were educated more, therefore, uh, your family, you're, encur you're encouraged to educate your children more, and so on and so forth. Right? In the Russian case, we know there's a variation. There were Protestants located in various parts of what's now Russia and Ukraine, right? in the Baltics, obviously. Right? There's also a distribution of, you know, of Muslims, whether it's in, um, down near Crimea or in, over near the Urals. Right? So that could be one factor. I don't have evidence one way or the other on this. Okay. The story that's been told in the United States, to bring up a different example, is that areas in the United States that um, where the population, uh, at least a large part of the population, was subject to slavery, i.e. where there's more African Americans who likely were the ancestors of, um, of slaves, right, show lower levels of human capital today. And so the story that's been told here, again, is this intergenerational one, that slaves themselves had their, hu their ability to get education suppressed, and that meant that they were less likely to educate their children, and so on and so forth. Now, I should point out the work by Bruce Sasserdote, who's at Dartmouth University, has emphasized that that effect probably goes away in a couple generations, right? even with many other constraints. But Bertocci and Demetrio right, and other scholars have pointed out that in the US case, race, you know, the fact that this population was racially identified and racism persisted, obviously, right? meant that there was political economy reasons to reinforce the low levels of human capital among the former slaves. Okay? So there's sort of an interaction between human capital provision and politics down the road. Right? So it's unlikely, though, in the Russian case, given that there's no markers, this is a point I'll come back to down later on, there's no markers for being, say, a former serf okay, today. You know, it's hard to tell, or was your ancestor a serf of somebody? No one knows. Okay? So there's no direct mapping, between, there's no characteristics you can identify about people today that would put them in, say, uh, a group in the past that would have had lower levels of human capital. So the, the intergenerational component's a little harder to see. Moreover, we know, so that's what I mean by multiple generations. We don't see, there's no tying of people to a particular group, and therefore no way to see an intergenerational effect over time of human capital accumulation. And we know that Soviet hum education policies in the 20s and the 30s targeted areas that had lower levels of schooling, say, for more schooling. And that included adult populations. So if you moved into a factory in the 20s and 30s, it was often likely, if you couldn't read, that there was some sort of little body, like literacy committee set up within the factory to help teach you. Yeah. So I would argue that there's no, that, that sort of this type of um, human capital channel from the past to the present, it's probably not directly there, but we want to understand why we still see this correlation that Lankin has found, right, between human capital levels in the past and human capital levels today, a geographic correlation. So I'll come back to that. Institutional persistence. So 
Um, so basically every economist today will at some point in their career do something or write about something to do with institutions. Right? At some level, that's just a lump all category for things we don't have other words for. Um, and this has been true for discussions of Russia. Oh, wow, the institutions in Imperial Russia were bad, the institutions in Soviet Russia were bad, and the institutions today in Russia are bad, right? Without being very precise about what any of that means, okay? Um, so what do we mean by institutions? So here's just mostly a laundry list, right? We could talk about political ones. This could be formal or informal political practices. You know, a whole group of economists that many of you in the room have probably heard about, you know, Duran Asimoglu, Jim Robinson, and that collective, right? It's argued that, well, things like constraining the executive are terribly important, making sure that, you know, you can't have the rise of autocrats, right? If you can think about the actual way government is structured, you know, or do you have different you know, branches, do you have a parliamentary system or not, so on and so forth, right? You think about who has voice, who has formal or informal ways to actually, you know, raise their, raise their hand up and vote for something, okay? And many, many other political types of institutions. The focus on institutions often gets stuck on politics. I'd like to highlight that economic historians, and this would include in some ways Asimoglu and his co-authors, right, have argued that this, the, the mechanism here, the persistence mechanism, how the past relates to the present, has to do with actually the distribution of, initially the distribution of, of wealth or income, so an economic distribution, right? Impacting who gets sort of, who has power initially, and that power gets manifest in particular institutions, say, who can vote, okay? And who can vote, if you're limiting it to the very rich, right? The very rich will keep voting for things, they're gonna keep them very rich, and so you get perpetuation of inequality and perpetuation of the institutions with potential adverse consequences for everyone else or for the entire economy. Right? I just had the work here by, by Stanley Engerman and Ken Sokoloff that made this really, I think, in a better way than Asimoglu and his co-authors did, really made this clear. Okay? That this processes did happen in the past in certain contexts. So Engerman and Sokoloff were writing about the Americas in general. In addition, political institutions, and I've just lumped here a bunch of things into what I call social institutions. These could be formal, as in the Imperial Russian case, you had formal <clears throat> social estates, right? So slowly. Apologies, my Russian these days are really bad. I haven't been in a while. <laughs> so if my, whatever I say sounds bad, I apologize. Um, right? That these might matter for economic activity, your ability to interact with somebody from a different class right, might matter for how types of contracts that get formed, the types of trade that can happen, and so on. You could also here talk about informal institutions, informal social institutions, social norms, you know, the role of women in the economy or in the labor force would be one example. And this gets very close to what a lot of people would call cultural, cultural practices and beliefs, right. In fact, when I teach about institutions, I simply say institutions is this big thing. Some of them are very formal, like the structure of government. And some of them are things like, you know, how well you treat your neighbor, you know. Because the institution is really just a thing that's governing economic interactions. The rules, the norms, the things that, that matter for how one economic party interacts with another. Okay? I'll come back to culture at the end. I'm, Carving off culture is a separate thing here, but I think the two are closely related. Another big category of, of, of institutions, which is really, I think, just the, the sort of intersection of politics and social institutions, right, is property rights and what I'll call here sort of rule of law, right? And this could include the formal institutions, the types of judicial system a society has, um, the types of enforcement, the police, so on and so forth. But it also could include the beliefs in those things, right? which those of you work on sort of modern, you know, thinking about, Ru you know, Russians thinking about, say, the functioning of the judicial system, right? And think maybe that's a little bit different in the Russian case, and maybe that has imperial antecedents. 
But under this category, it also includes the sort of norms, the rules, the laws about who can own what. That might include land, formal, you know, property rights in land. It might include capital, who can actually have a factory. And there was various informal practices prior to 1861, you know, the nobility were sort of discouraged, if not explicitly prevented, from, say, owning factories. But that, for the Russian case, I'm going to argue, most precisely hits, or this sort of category most precisely matters, for thinking about serfdom. Right? And so what I'm going to then move into is this case study paper I mentioned, it's a, a, a separate work, that really focuses in on serfdom and its legacy for the imperial Russian economy. Right? As an example, broadly speaking, of institution in the past mattering for institutions today. Um, before I get there, uh, just really quickly, thinking about these categories, so these things right here, these three, right? In the Russian, so this is sort of general, but in the Russian context, right, we know there's a long literature, and in fact, in, I realize in preparing this lecture that it's like an infinitely large literature, argues that there's just something authoritarian about Russia, and that belief in authoritarianism has persisted in some form or another throughout, you know, since at least the, you know, the princes in Kiev and so forth. Right? Um, but this goes hand in hand also in the long literature about governance in Russia with this notion that in the Russian state, regardless of what they're doing in the Soviet period, was never very strong in many measurable ways. They weren't doing very much sometimes, often. Right? We, can, you can, we can talk about that down the road. At the same time, they tried to you know, have a state sort of push towards development, right? This was true in the imperial period when you think about sort of Vitae program and sort of state, you know, substituting for the missing prerequisites of modern economic growth, sort of Gershon Krohn's phrase, right? Often with, again, sort of military emphasis, emphasizing, you know, factories, capital getting big at the expense of the average consumer, say, right? And that's true not just in the imperial period, but obviously that's, that's sort of Soviet policy in a nutshell. I think as Mark Harrison argued in his lecture about a month and a half ago here, right, that this military sort of conscription aspect of, of Russian economic development in the Soviet period is sort of a key to understanding what's going on. Right? But it's obviously true that sort of statement is true in thinking about modern Russian economy today. So there, again, the persistence of this political sort of focus on the type of economic development that's being pushed. What I would point out is that given that we did have this thing called 1917, and then we had 1989, right, and we had 1998, these large shocks have really dramatically changed who had political power and who had economic power. Right? And those changes have meant that sort of channels that say bad institutions are perpetuated by inequality, that's probably not the case in the Russian context, at least as laid out by other economic historians. Because you're changing the elite time and time again. You're changing the, the sort of distribution of resources in the economy time and time again. Again, thinking through institutional factors along with Russian development, there's been a big emphasis on just the weakness or what you could call the conditionality of property rights. You only get access to that piece of property because someone in political power says you can have access to it. That means it's conditional on your good behavior. Right? Now one good example here is just think about agricultural land. Right? In the imperial period, we had communes right? of various types. Right? This sort of collectivity about property rights, meaning they're not well specified for the individual cultivator. We had then collectivization, which sort of ramps this up to the next degree. And then there's now a large literature about really the inadequacy of property rights in agricultural land after 1991, right? The inability to construct a land law and so on and so forth, right? And the, the land law that is eventually created being one that doesn't really enable or clarify the property rights coming out of collective farms, right? Just to point out that there is this long run persistence of weak property rights in that one dimension. Another huge literature among legal scholars and legal historians of Russia and the former Soviet Union points out that rule of law has never been you know, a real common feature uh, of, of Russia. Right? 
Um, uh, Kathy Henley at the University of Wisconsin calls this or refers to this sort of this legal, ne legal nihilist argument with regard to Russian history, right? The fact that, you know, no one's ever believed in the functionality of the courts and so on and so forth throughout, from the imperial period, the Soviet period, and to today, right? In other work I'm engaged in right now that looks at corporate law, right? There is some sign, some evidence that, you know, corporate law was structured then in the imperial period just to benefit a few insiders, really. Okay? Now, we can think about examples today that the corporate, the functioning at least of corporate law in modern Russia has a somewhat similar flavor. Again, I'm not drawing the historical processes linking the past to the present. I'm just pointing out that there might be a relationship. However, um, Kathy Henley and others have also pointed out that in the past, as well as today, there actually is a surprising amount, sort of, <coughs> excuse me, of lower level usage of courts and belief in the actual role of law, uh, rule of law. Not maybe for big case, not for the Khodorovskis and other cases like that, but for the day-to-day -day use of the legal system. Russians in the past, Jane Burbank wrote about peasant usage of uh, township courts. Right? Uh, Sergei Antonov, in his new book, writes about bankruptcy, bankruptcy law and its usage. That these things, that there seems to be some amount of, I guess, rule of law, not absence of rule of law. And so it's hard to draw a direct connection between the past and the present. And so finally, I just point out in terms of labor coercion, we had slavery in Russia, you know, back in the medieval period. That translated eventually to serfdom. That, in some ways, translated into Soviet labor law in various ways, about restrictions on where you could live and what you could work on. Right? You can think about the gulag as well as being part of this. And you can think about examples of the way the labor markets in Russia work today that have these limitations and constraints upon them. Okay? All right. So, Focusing on this case study I've mentioned a couple times. So this is joint work with Johannes Bugel, who's a postdoc at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, we were just interested initially at saying, okay, what's the correlation between areas that had serfdom in Imperial Russia and outcomes today? Like that's step one. Again, I say that's not the type of economic history I like or try to do in my day-to-day -day life. Um, but hey, I had the data, why not at least look at it? Okay. So, the, I mean, again, not, there's a huge, huge, huge world of literature about people who have you know, pointed out that serfdom really mattered for the imperial Russian e economy right, in various ways, even after it ended. So even after emancipation, the way emancipation occurs continues to matter, and I've done work in this area. Right? In other contexts, people have made more explicit about, wow, that coercive labor institution in the past, whether it's American slavery, African slavery with Nathan Nunn's work at Harvard, or Melissa Dell's looked at essentially uh, a form of slavery in Peru, mining in Peru in the 17th century in her case, right? That those forms of labor coercion directly impact outcomes today. In Nathan Nunn's work, he, sh he can show that where slavery was more prominent in Africa, people trust each other less today. Okay? There's many mechanisms that could link that labor coercion in the past to outcomes today. The first paper mentioned here is talking about political preferences, linking slavery in the past to outcomes today. Right? Now, the work I've done, other people have done, point out that yes, it seems that serfdom was bad in the past, while it existed, and then in the at least 50 years up to the revolution, the question you could ask, is it plausible at all that serfdom, and I'll be precise about what I mean by that in a second, would have had effects that persisted through the whole Soviet period? Okay? And if so, how? Right? Is it an institutional thing? An institutional feature? I'll just say initially, it's definitely not going to be a cultural thing. Because again, you can't map who's, who was, whose ancestors were serfs in today's Russian population. Okay? So, a map. So this is European Russia, i.e. west of the Urals, circa 1861. And you can't read these numbers over here or figure out what the shading is. But this is the share of the population who right at the cusp of emancipation uh, were serfs in the sense that they were 
uh, peasants residing on land owned by private, the nobility, let's say. Right? Not peasants residing on land owned by the state or by the Romanov family, that's actually a distinct class, or other more independent classes of peasants. Ones on, located on land held by the nobility. And you, again, can't see, this varies. The light shading is from basically 0 to 10%, all the way up to the dark shading is, you know, 85% of the population, the total population in a district, you know, were serfs. But to look at the long-run effects, we need some data today. So this is European, Russia, and Imperial, in the Imperial period. Uh, even the Baltics are here. They did not have serfdom circa 1861. Right? Um, we need data today that covers all those areas, Belarus, Ukraine, so on and so forth. And that's actually a little bit of a harder issue. So what we use in this particular paper is something called the Life and Transition Survey, which is done by the European, the World Bank was involved, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, I think. It spans several countries. It's geo-referenced, meaning we can match that picture with where these people are surveyed today. Right? And it gives us a measure, at least at the household level, of, you know, think about this as like income, well-being, expenditures. Right? We also have a bunch of other data about household characteristics and so on and so forth. So this is a household survey that covers all of that territory I just showed you. Right? In a nutshell, we find that the past, those areas with serfdom in the past, even conditional, controlling for a lot of other things, geography, religious composition of the population, so on and so forth, have much worse outcomes today. Okay. A 1SD, that's standard deviation. Okay. Increase in our measure of serfdom, the one I showed you previously, right, is associated with about 10 to 14% or even more in other specifications. Lower per capita consumption today. Okay. That's a big number. And in the paper, and I'm perfectly happy to supply it if people are curious, we argue that this is a causal, uh, statistically causal relationship. And for those of you who have had your you know, econometrics or some version of that, because we use the expropriation of land, the conversion of some peasants away sort of from something like serfdom to something else 100 years prior to 1864, I, or 1861, under Catherine the Great when she expropriated the monastic lands. And those peasants get converted into state peasants, right? So we exploit that to give us some variation in where serfdom was by 1861. So we know the Soviets did things to the rural economy, okay? In fact, I can't do a lot of the analysis. I can't draw pictures like this because there's no good map of local level, like say, Rayoni in the Soviet period, frankly. So there's no direct impact of past institutions on institutions today. Everything's blown up in 1917 for the most part. Moreover, in our work in this paper, we actually show using measures from this survey of, say, how do you trust your neighbor? Do you trust government? So on and so forth. Right? That there's very little relationship between where serfdom was and cultural measures today. We do find, and I'll be Try to be careful here. We do find that those areas that had more serfdom in the past, serfs were a greater share of the population. Right? They had lower urbanization, maybe unsurprisingly, and factory production up to 1917. So that's after emancipation, okay? 50 plus years after. Right? There's no urban catch-up growth. Urban centers in former serf districts actually grew slower after 1917 than urban areas in non-surf districts, right? everything else the same. There's increasingly fewer defense, our, our, our proxy, our best proxy for industrial facilities in former surf areas relative to non-surf. Right? And finally, we find other infrastructure measures are also poor down the road. So we have lower railroad development, I don't mention it here, prior to 1915, we see that persist down the road as well. So it seems like those areas that had serfs, more serfs, do worse throughout, all the way through the Soviet period. The question is why? Oh, I would, except for one dimension. Today, the former serf areas show lower human capital, lower schooling levels. In the past, though, using data from the 19th century, they don't. 
So if all this is happening, but the human capital one's not, what's going on? Okay, I'm sorry to show you, just to show you that that's true, there's lower urbanization prior to 1917, that's a negative number, it's red, which means it's important. Um, there's less factory production and less factory productivity per worker and so on and so forth, all prior to uh, 1917. Again, data constraints are really hard during the Soviet period, especially geographically disaggregate data to match to that map I showed you of serfdom. But what we can look at is urbanization, and here is just over time, think about the, what this is, is each, these are different census years, in the Soviet all the way to 2002, right? In these different years, the relative urban growth rate for cities in former surf areas is lower. That's what it means when it's going down, okay? So we see this less, less urban growth. Finally, again, not to belabor the statistical exercise here, this is just to show that in those former surf areas, right, areas with more serfdom, saw, saw lower accumulation of defense industrial plants through the Soviet period. This is our only good measure of industrial activity that we can match over the whole period. Right? Now, one confounding issue that you might be struck is, well, maybe it was just Soviet, po Soviet policies of some sort that reinforced existing, pre-existing distribution of economic activity over space, right? What could those be? Well, it could be World War II, the shifting of industrial production away from the front, right? It could also be the gulag, the location of camps, which other authors have argued actually probably had local positive effects on the economy, right? And we don't know this. This is an open issue for us in our research. We're still working on thinking through some of these issues, right? But overall, to summarize that with this work, we find these long-run correlations between where serfdom was and outcomes today. Right? But we don't think it's about institutional persistence per se. Because right? we think the Soviets actually pretty much took care of that channel. Right? They changed things. Right? <laughs> and again, we find lower levels of human capital in the past, but not, or sorry, in the present, but not the past. So our explanation for the human capital side of the story is that, you know, in early industrialization in the, in the imperial period, it didn't matter whether you were literate or not. This is the earliest, it didn't matter in the British Industrial Revolution whether a worker was literate or not. At least that's the argument that's been made. By the time they move to today, literacy obviously is complementary with industrial development, okay? So that's why we think there's a change. So the key driver then is, is the industrial activity itself and how that's more or less in surf and not surf areas, okay? And so our story boils down to labor mobility issues. So in the imperial period, you had serfdom, and then you had various constraints put in place on the newly emancipated serfs. In the Soviet period, you had passport laws. I should say in the imperial period, you also had passport laws, work passport laws. You couldn't move a certain distance without getting a passport, and then getting it reapproved by the local officials you know, contingent upon paying your taxes and your family being politically connected and so on and so forth. Soviets also have a pa work passport system in place. And even today, it's the ability of workers to say move where wages are high, geographically, right, is limited in the Russian case. And some of that is things like housing stock issues. You can't find an apartment in places. But others are more sort of fundamental. Right? And that difference over time perpetuates initial conditions, differences in initial conditions in that agglomeration way that I mentioned back when I talked about geography. So just two, three more slides, I'm done. So culture, right? So when economists think about culture, they tend to think about beliefs, norms, behavior that's, you know, it's, it's, it's present within a particular group whether defined by religion or ethnicity or something else, right? And it often has some intergenerational transmission mechanism, right? You learn your culture from your parents and your social group and so on and so forth, right? So like I mentioned in the serfdom paper, we find very little connection between serfdom and culture today, and we think that's due to the fact there's, there's nothing like race demarcating who was a serf in the past and who, you know, or whose ancestors were serfs in the past, like there is in the U.S. case or in the Brazilian case, for example. 
in addition, we think the revolution itself, by you know, emphasizing you know, the lower class, sort of changed culture in ways that would have eliminated a direct cultural channel between the imperial economy and today. We do think there's other possible cultural linkages between the past and the present that matter for economic development in the long run in Russia. Right? So attitudes regarding trust, markets, democracy, to the extent that democracy might matter for economic outcomes, right, probably persisted. I'm going, to mention, I'm going to talk about this work in a second. You also see some signs among some work of long-run resistance to quote -unquote, privatization. You know, people build in their belief systems that, you know, Private property is a bad thing, you know? And whether the, where these beliefs come from could be argued. The HRS is arguing some of his work. You know, you could tie a little bit of it to orthodoxy itself, okay? Dower and Markovich show that the Stolypin reforms in the 1900s, people's resistance to those reforms is correlated with resistance to privatization today, geographically. Another one in here I'm really, you know, hand waving, throwing up, I, I have no good hard evidence here, is simply that policymakers themselves, over time in Russia, seem to have a certain ideology, a certain set of beliefs that is persistent. And that is beliefs about, you know, being big when it comes to a factory is a good thing. Right. To hell or high, you know, to hell with the economics, bigger is better. Right. This notion that Russia is behind and therefore we have to do things to catch up. That's a, that's a belief that policymakers have. And that's something in the 19th century, that's something Soviets definitely had, and that's something that even is present today in policymakers. Um, and finally, an emphasis on investment in industry and capital to the detriment of consumption and services and living standards of the population. That seems to be a persistent characteristic of policymakers. So again, the bottom line is that there may be some of these channels. And I, again, don't have hard evidence on these. Some work does make this explicit. Um, but I think these deeply rooted cultural beliefs might matter in various ways, whether it's reinforcing authoritarianism, which might matter for economic development, or through some of these other channels I point out here. Right? And just to highlight one, the one paper in this literature, that this work by uh, Grossfeld, Zhirovskaya, and co-authors, um, has used geography, geographic differences in culture over uh, in, within European Russia to show that there can be long-run differences in, in beliefs, right? Um, and so while most empirical evidence in this theme is lacking, their work, and here's a picture, um, makes this argument. So they look in what's one paper at the Pale of Settlement. Okay? So within the Pale of Settlement, which is on the left-hand side of this, this is like distance here, so here's zero. Can you explain what the Pale of Settlement is? Oh, Pale of Settlement, sorry. Uh, various legal and cultural social norm practices that limited where Jews could reside in Imperial Russia to, I had the map in the previous version of this slide and I took it away, to essentially what's now Western Ukraine, Belarus, a little bit of, of sort of Western reaches of Russia, right? Um, created Catherine the Great in sort of in the 18th century as a formal thing, right? So anyway, what, these, what does this point out? So, on this side of the border, I, in the Pale of Settlement, right, up here is a measure, how much do you like the market over the state as a way to allocate resources? In this one, do you think self-employment's a good or a bad thing? I, you know, you know, sort of nascent entrepreneurship or capitalism a good thing, right? Inside the Pale, less. Less there, less there. Now, you might puzzle yourself, well, well wait a second. If the Jews were there, and we tend to associate, I, mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't want to make this argument, but it could be made that people tend to associate Judaism with you know, beliefs in these sorts of things, given what the occupational restrictions Jews had in many places, and so on and so forth. It'd be a bit puzzling to see this relationship. But the argument in this paper is that once, the, once pogroms happen, and once Jews leave the pale, sort of from late 19th century into the Soviet period, right? The people who replace them right, have these sets of preferences relative to the people on this side, outside the pale, who never were changed, who didn't interact with Jews or anyway. It's like there's like a conservative backlash against Jews that puts people on this side of the border. Right? That's their argument here. And they've shown similar work with respect to the carving up of Poland. 
Carving up a Poland has long-run uh, effects on people's beliefs. I mean, the Russian parts believe different, or have cultural practices different than the German, than the Ukrainian bits, and that's persisted to today. Okay, so my last slide, just to conclude. So I've suggested there are these four channels by which elements of the imperial economy, and here I'm using the word economy very broadly, as you can tell. I've talked about politics, culture, things, institutions that don't seem economic on their face, right? But they all matter for how resources are allocated, which is really the heart of economics. Right? But those characteristics, features of the imperial economy, probably did matter a bit for thinking about how Russia's developed in the long run, even through the Soviet period. In, de in fact, in some cases, it seems like Soviet policy sort of built upon in the imperial regime in ways that persisted, that kept this, uh, that reinforced these conditions. Now, this is not a new argument by any stretch. I've mentioned it in several places throughout this talk that a long series of historians have made the claim that there's, you know, just features of Russia that matter, that are different, right? This Russian distinctiveness, right? So I don't know what to think about that literature, but and I'll have one final point in a second to say about that. The point here is that causal evidence, hard data that shows that something in the past is affecting things today, that's a, really, that's a much harder, the higher bar to cross, right? You can make the, the argument that, you know, Russia's always been like that, but then you have to show it somehow, okay? Show that that is true. So when people correlate conditions in the past with outcomes today, in this literature I mentioned at the beginning, this long-run deep roots of economic development literature, right, they often tend to ignore the fact that there's history in between. Right? Right? And therefore, to really show that there is some long-run persistence, you definitely need to examine the history and examine how the history is going to impact all those, those four things I've talked about in a way over time, and how, the, how you know, simple economics can help us understand what's going on. And I sort of think, you know, at the end of the day, some of these considerations, thinking about some of this geography, thinking about ways that policies have been perpetuated over time, through beliefs and so on and so forth, can be useful for thinking about policy recommendations today when it comes to the Russian economy. And I can answer questions about that in question and answer. And so I think this is an area, in general, of very fruitful interdisciplinary research. I'm a little wary about getting involved in this area. Like I said, I like to just think about the past and not worry about too much how it matters today. Um, but for those of you in the room that are thinking about projects and so on and so forth, you know, there's a lot of data in the Russian case. And examining some of these issues could be a fruitful endeavor. So thank you. Thank you. And I meant fruitful by you could like harvest things. There was a metaphor here. <laughs>